what the hell, it's JLL, that Gnostic teacher on the internet. I'm here again. It's the 27th of December, 2017. And I have a little nursery rhyme for you. It goes like this. What is the power at the end of pretending when the story of evil has a lovely ending? I'm here today to talk about a certain pig of my acquaintance. And before I get into a long and dazzling riff on pigs and pork, that controversial subject of pork, just let me say something about the people of the pork. The people of the pork are the people of the pork taboo. You know that a taboo in traditional native cultures around the world, and this is a universal and invariable theme, a taboo, something that is forbidden to the tribe, was originally and always associated with a plant or animal. So there would be a taboo animal designated by the shamanic leaders of the tribe. For instance, the totem animal might be a salmon. Now, the totem animal is taboo. This is the traditional way of life. This is the traditional formula that can be found in the animistic cultures on this planet. The previously existing animistic cultures, which have all more or less now disappeared or been decimated and annihilated. The totem animal is taboo. What that means is that the members of the tribe are not allowed to eat the taboo animal. It's sacred to the tribe, and it's considered to be a source of magic power, healing force, and guidance. But on the other hand, there are exceptions. There are moments in the sacred calendar. There are special festivities when the taboo is suspended, and at that moment the tribe is allowed to eat the taboo animal, but only on those occasions. So you find that among quite a number of people on this planet, that is to say billions, there's a taboo on pork, isn't there? Who does not eat pork? Well, principally there are two people. Those descendants of the ancient Hebrews, known by their own designation as the Yehudis, and... Muslims who are adherents to Islam. The rule in Islam is that the pig is taboo and eating pork is forbidden. Same rule in Judaism, right? So you can put all those billions of people in the same bin. And you can say, or in the same pen, if you like, or in the same paddock, you can put them all in the same bin and you can say, those billions of people are really people of the pork because their religious and ethnic identity is defined by the taboo on pork. You follow me? Now, I want to point out, uh, I don't want to make this subject too complicated. Well, obviously, that does not appear to be the second part of the formula Second part of the formula, excuse me, does not appear to, to be operative in this taboo. In other words, I don't believe there is any time in which 
Jews or Muslims are allowed to eat pork. That is to say that the taboo would be suspended at exceptional moments. And that's a really interesting fact upon which I could comment at length, but I'm just going to leave it go for now. It would require too much of a digression, and I might pick it up at some other moment, but I urge you to bear in mind that the taboo on pork among these peoples is, in fact, an exception to the universal rule of the taboo, as I just described. The taboo is not suspended, presumably, but traditionally the taboo can always be suspended at certain moments. So I'm not going to talk much about the people of the pork right now, because I'm going to make a critical distinction, okay? <laughs> a critical distinction which recalls what I said in my little chat on the Christ mess. I noted the all too obvious and well known fact that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are called the Abrahamic religions, and they are all, in fact, all three are three versions of the same faith and the same belief system. But I did point out that Christians, in some respects, stand apart because the majority of Christians who adhere to Abrahamic religion in the form of Christianity, be it Protestant, Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, or whatever, the majority of those adherents of the Christian faith are of the white European races and not of the Semitic races and the Arabian racial stock. Now, it's true, there are many black Christians in Africa, there are many Chinese Christians, but I'm going to just simplify the discourse here. Just leave those aside because I want to concentrate on white European and American Christians right now. And in a way, I kind of address this talk to them. I have a special message for them that comes through in the course of this talk. Okay? Now, as I proceed here and get to the point, I invite you to look at something with me. I invite you to look at a, an issue, proposition, question, which could be considered, I would say, one of the ten, if not one of the five top questions in the entire range of human history. Throughout its history, the human species, recorded history as far as we know, has faced certain momentous questions. And this is one of them. It's an issue that has monumental proportions. And I will introduce it by stating it in the form of a proposition. Some have argued this proposition over the centuries, and they argue it today. And they expressed the proposition in this way. Religion provides the framework for morals. So, one of the purposes of religion, apart from what it, ever it may do to induce a feeling of the connection to the divine and the creator, and all of that, apart from what it might do, say, metaphysically speaking, there is the issue of what it does morally. And there is an argument that has been carried on through the centuries, persisting down to this day. There is an argument which to this day engages passionate involvement. And that argument is 
Human beings need religion in order to act in a manner that is morally correct. Now, what do I mean by morally correct? Well, I'll just give you a loose formula to act in a way that expresses goodness, non-harming of others, mutual aid, maybe compassion. To act in a kind and benevolent way in a non-harming way toward other human beings, other human animals, as I say, is to act morally, to behave, to have good behavior. And so the argument is that human beings require a rule book of morals in order to exhibit good behavior. And of course, that argument implies that without the rule book, they would behave badly. Now, I'm not going to embellish too much what the rules of behavior are. That's not the point here. Just making a case for this argument. Religion is necessary. So the religion embraced by Christians, the Christian faith, with its various principles and teachings, some of them taken from the Old Testament, such as the Ten Commandments, some of them taken from the New Testament, such as the alleged teachings attributed to Jesus. This set of rules, this is a set of rules, and many people who embrace the Christian faith firmly believe that they need this set of rules they need the behavioral rule book to guide them and to tell them how to behave and be good people, okay? And so the fact is, it's no surprise to anyone, that whatever its metaphysical and theological assumptions might be, whatever the bells and whistles of theology are, whatever the supernaturalism is included in religion, such as the virgin birth and miracles and so forth, all of that aside, the Christian faith comes with a rule book. And it's really important to bear in mind that Christians attribute those rules to the Father God or the off-planet Creator God. So the authority behind the rule book of Christian behavior is God plus the Messiah, Son of God, Jesus, plus various apostles. And this crew is the source of rules of behavior. And ultimately, tracing it back to its origin, the authority behind the rules is a superhuman, off-planet authority. You cannot see or touch the Father God, the Creator, and yet, nevertheless, the Father God is in some way the ultimate authority who dictates these rules. So, Yahweh dictated the rules of the Ten Commandments to Moses, and so forth and so on. Jesus himself, in the New Testament, Yeshua, is said to have been the living instrument of God, the Son, only begotten, divinely virgin-born Son, who is the instrument who speaks for God. So, therefore, Jesus also has the authority of the off-planet Father God. And that's where the rules of behavior for Christians come from. All right. Now, I ask you to consider this proposition a little exercise in what if. What if is always or usually a helpful syntax because it loosens up the NLP and it invites you to consider how things could be otherwise than they generally are. Now I'm concentrating on those Christians who have any denomination of Christianity 
Catholic, Protestant, whatever, Calvinist, Mormons, or whatever, who are convinced that they need the moral precepts and behavioral rules of their faith in order to be good people. Now, I ask you this question. What if those Christians could, in fact, actually be really good people innately and that they could, in fact, act in a morally upright and correct way, doing no harm where no harm is due, exhibiting mutual aid, exhibiting friendliness, compassion, honesty, and other admirable qualities, accountability, taking responsibility for their actions. What if those Christians who believe they must rely on the rule book for morals could actually exhibit those morals without the book? But they don't know that. Now, consider that proposition for a minute. And I'm going to ask you to play along with me as I introduce a little terminology. I'm going to propose that there are two kinds of Christians. First group I'm going to call Indie Christians. Indie is short for independent. So, you know, you come up with that phrase, in indie films, an indie filmmaker. What is that? Well, it's someone who makes a film independent of the great film studios and the Hollywood moguls, who are all Zenosh. So if you're indie, you make a film independent of that structure. So I'm going to call a certain group of Christians the indie Christians. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that they are simply the human animals who can actually act in a morally correct way, independent of their Christian faith. They may not know that, but they actually can. Well, obviously, they wouldn't know that until they dropped their Christian faith. And then, lo and behold, if they were able to drop their Christian faith, and be released from that belief system and everything that goes with it, well, lo and behold, they might look at themselves, they might look down at themselves, down at their body, look uh, at their hands, look at their feet and say, OMG, I can actually be just as good a person as I thought I was as a Christian without being one. In fact, maybe I can even be a better person. So I tell you that those are indie Christians. Now, by contrast to them, I would propose another term, which I'm going to call zombie Christians. Now, the zombie Christians are those for whom what everything that I just said is an inconceivable proposition. Not only is it inconceivable, it is inachievable. So they are Christians, that is to say, adherents of the Christian faith, indoctrinated as Catholics, as Protestants, as evangelicals, whatsoever. They are attached to the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments, perhaps only the New Testament, They are attached to the so-called teachings of Jesus. And they are in a situation regarding morals, moral behavior, where they could not know how to act morally in any situation if they did not rely upon the behavioral rule book provided for them by their religion. Why do I call them zombies? Well, those Christians are equivalent to zombies in the sense. A zombie is an entity 
that has no will or agency of its own. This is actually the technical definition of zombie. You know, there's a lot of Hollywood hype about zombies and the zombie apocalypse. But if you go and read The Serpent and the Rainbow by Wade Davis, which is a brilliant book and beautifully written, you will learn all you need to know about Voodoo, the true voodoo magic of Haiti. And his descriptions of Haiti and the practices of Voodoo are extremely beautiful. And as far as I know, they are accurate and authentic. It will really give you a feeling for the Haitian people. And the story of Wade Davis writing The Serpent and the Rainbow started with a challenge that he had. I believe it was at Harvard, and he was talking to Richard Schultes, Schultes who is the leading ethnobotanist of the 20th century and was a close friend of Gordon Wasson and Albert Hoffman, for instance. So ethnobotany is the study of the pharmacological properties of plants, including psychoactive plants. So Schultes was interested in the subject of the zombie because it came to his attention that zombies were created by Voodoo priests by giving a certain formula to the person who then turned into the zombie. And on the agreement that he made with Schultes and some other people at Harvard, Wade Davis went off to Haiti to find out what that fracking formula was, and he found it. It's incredible. So his book actually reveals the material formula for creating a zombie. And when you look at the zombie, the profile of the zombie, as Wade Davis describes it, you see that it is an entity that is then remote controlled by the, the sorcerer or shaman who creates it. So once the zombie is raised again from the dead, which is really a state of, of, a, of a coma, it's put into a coma by the formula that is given to it. Sometimes the powder of the formula is spread on the threshold of a house and is absorbed through the soles of the feet. There are other ways to give the zombie formula. When someone is given the zombie formula, they fall into a coma. They are recalled out of the coma by the shaman sorcerer, and then they are remotely controlled, and they will do whatever the shaman sorcerer telepathically commands them to do, or directly by verbal command. That's the true formula of a zombie in Haitian uh, magic in Haitian voodoo or voodoo. Okay, so when I say zombie Christians, I mean just that. They're in a coma, they're in a stupor due to the brainwashing of their religion and the delusional trance of Christian faith. And they never act out of their own agency. They only act by remote control on the commands coming from the off-planet Father God. Is that clear? Zombie Christians. Now, I submit to you, if you follow along with this little uh, exercise in description, I submit to you that zombie Christians are not able to act on their own agency without the moral rule book, without the book of behavioral rules, be it the Old Testament being the sayings of Jesus. That does not mean that they are able to act on all of those rules either. For instance, I doubt if there are very few Christians in the world, particularly zombie Christians, who act on the rule Love thine enemy, do good to those who hate you, turn the other cheek. That's in the rule book of the New Testament, isn't it? Those rules are said to come from the mouth of the divine Son of God himself, aren't they? Well, there are damn few Christians who can follow those rules. Nevertheless, the zombie Christians 
can only act morally or in a way that they consider to be moral by following the rules. So they are under remote control from the rule book, and the rule book is the instrument of the voice of authority of the Father God. Is that picture clear? Now let's go back and look again at the Indie Christians. I'm saying that the Indie Christians, I'm saying, what if, okay? What if? What if the Indie Christians are actually able, through referring to their own moral compass and their own innate sense of what is right and wrong and what is appropriate to do, suppose they are actually able to behave in a morally correct fashion, independent of the rule book. Just suppose, just hold that thought for a moment. Just to make this analogy perfectly clear, I'll shift it to another example of a GPS. Suppose that you want to go to Malibu, and suppose that you know how to go to Malibu. Maybe you'll live somewhere in the mountains of the coast of California, and you know how to walk from where you live up in the mountains down to a place on the coast called Malibu. It would take you maybe four or five hours, but you know, you know the, the ravines, you know where to cross, you know where to head down toward uh, the coast. So you know the way to Malibu, and you can do it out of your own reckoning. But suppose that someone rigs you up to a GPS, and you are rigged up to this GPS in such a way that you have no other option but to follow it. You know, some electrodes or some kind of uh, chip has been inserted into your brain so that the GPS remote directional device shows you how to get to Malibu and guides you along the course, up and down the hills, across the ravines and so forth. And you are compelled to do what the GPS system tells you to do because it's an implant. But if you didn't have the GPS installed, you could find your way to Malibu perfectly well on your own. That's what I say about indie Christians. That is not the case with zombie Christians. Now, the situation with indie Christians... I think, I mean, I I like this description. I'm having a good time with this. And I am talking to Christians here. I'm talking to you all. But I've known Christians all my life. I was brought up in a Christian community. For many years, I knew no one but Christians. They were my closest friends and my non-blood family. I was also deeply involved in what is called Christology, and esoteric Christianity along the lines of anthroposophy and the teachings of Rudolf Steiner, as well as some uh, alchemical and hermetic traditions of Europe, which are said to be permeated with esoteric Christianity. So I've walked that road, and I know that road pretty well, and I'm talking in an intimate way to any of you who might be indie Christians. So now I want to go a little deeper. And I want to say to both directly to indie Christians and also to those of you who are not Christians who are just sitting in class here and and going through this exercise with me to see what you can learn from it, okay? Because I know from your comments on my recent talks that a lot of you just can't stand Christianity of any form, and will have nothing to do with that. But it's not irrelevant to you, and I'll tell you why. You'll see why if you stick with me. It's not irrelevant even to you who have already rejected Christianity or whatever. Let's go a little deeper. I'm going to get really intimate with these potential anti-Christians. I'm going to put this question to them. What if it happened that you went into church and got down on your knees 
You only pretended to pray. But you didn't really pray. You were just pretending. Well, that's a Mandela effect, isn't it? California dreaming. The mamas and the papas. I went into the church. I got down on my knees and I pretend to pray. I began to pray. Began to pray. Pretend to pray. That's the Mandela effect. And it is a genuine effect. Richly supported by residue. For instance, covers on the song. So what if the Indic Christians who rely on the biblical book of rules to guide them to be good people are only pretending that they need those rules? And in fact, they don't. And without following that rule book, Old Testament Ten Commandments, New Testament sayings of Jesus, without following it, they could be just as good people as they are now. And who the fuck knows? Maybe they could even be better. Maybe they could even be somehow more effective in the world. They could be more powerful. Hi, what about that? More powerful and effective, authentic human beings. If they let go of pretending that they need the rule book. What about that? I leave that as an open proposition. At the 31 minute point in this talk, it's a good point to take a pause and leave that as an open proposition. Remember that that proposition refers back to a Mandela effect. I got down on my knees and I pretend to pray. It doesn't say I pretended to pray. The occluded version, I got down on my knees and I began to pray, is in the past tense. But the Occluding version, the Mandela effect, is in the present tense, I pretend. What does that tell you? It tells you that there's a massive act of pretending current, current in the religious experience of the human species. Now you might note, I just remind you, when I described my discovery of that Mandela effect, it was one of the first effects that came to my attention in the summer of 2016, just after the Mandela Effect phenomenon had come to my attention. And I explained in one of those talks that there is a practice in Planetary Tantra called following, observing the lunar shaktis, or following the shifts of the moon each month. And I indicated that in this practice, the tantrikas, or shaktas of planetary tantra assign a particular dakini or tutelary deity to each shift. And so the shift of a certain dakini, I'll clarify that word in a moment, the shift of a certain guide or guiding power connected to Sophia, that began, I believe it was in July, corresponded in an uncanny way with that Mandela effect, which I discovered, which came to my attention on the very first or second day of the new shift. You can go back and find that talk and see how I explained that. Okay. Now. Consider this. What if the Indian Christians were released from pretending 
so that they could be the genuine, effective, and powerful human agents of morality and goodness and kindness in the world that they wish to be. And they could do it entirely independent of anything in the kit of Christianity. Anything. They don't need the rules of the Old Testament. They don't need the sayings of Jesus in the New Testament. They don't need St. Paul. They don't need any of the other apostles, nor do they need all the metaphysical and theological regalia of Christianity. Vicarious atonement, the virgin birth, the miraculously born Messiah, the sacrifice of the divine child in the form of the grown Messiah man in order to save humanity in a miraculous act of intervention. They don't need any of it to be what they so want to be as Christians. What if that were the case? Well, that would raise the question of how do the Indian Christians find release from pretending? I give you this phrase, savor this phrase. This phrase is like a fragrance. It's the fragrance of the great liberation release from pretending. How would the Indy Christians be released from pretending that they need something that they don't need so that they can become authentically human? Well, how would anyone come to that experience? How would anyone come to the experience of release from pretending? It's a rhetorical question, obviously. I'm posing this question, and of course I already know the answer. So my purpose in the remainder of this talk, and my intention for the takeaway, is to answer that rhetorical question. How do you come to the experience of release from pretending? so that you can be the complete and authentic human individual that you wish to be without the extraneous baggage of any belief or any external system of dogma or guiding rules. How can you come to that experience? Well, here I have to get personal and I have to be intimate and I'll be totally transparent and honest with you. You come to it in one way and one way only. You come to it in the way that I have come to it, in the way that everyone in my firsthand circle of acquaintances and friends has come to it, and in the way that countless numbers of other people who have written me come to it. You come to release from pretending by following a pig. And not just following the pig, but taking instruction from that pig. And that is some pig, as the line goes in Charlotte's Web. That is some pig. You have to follow a pig to undergo release from pretending. Ah, great. Well, this is great news in one respect because it means you can write off you-know-who. You can write off the Hebrew peoples who adhere to Judaism and you can write off all peoples, whether they be Arabic or not, whether they be of Arabian stock or not, who adhere to Islam, because the taboo against pork is absolute in Islam, isn't it? 
It's unthinkable. <laughs> Do I have to say this? It's unthinkable that any Jew or Muslim would ever follow a pig. See what I mean? Kind of clears the stage, don't it? So who is this fabled pig? Well, it's not just an ordinary pig. It's a diamond pig. The diamond sow. Also called the adamantine sow. Adamantine being an adjective meaning of or like diamond. The diamond sow is the pig that leads to release from pretending. Now, some of you might be familiar with this odd term. If you've ventured into Buddhism, and particularly into Tibetan Buddhism, you have encountered a certain entity who is variously called Vajrayogini, Vajravarahi, and Dorje Fagmo in Tibetan. Now, Vajra means various things in Sanskrit. It can mean diamond, something that is hard as diamond. It can also mean thunder, thunder and lightning, both. Dorje is the Tibetan word. Varahi in Sanskrit is pig or sow. So Vajra Varahi is the diamond sow. By the way, just for the record, the German equivalent to the word diamond, Vajra, Dorje, is blitz, as in blitzkrieg, lightning war, blitzkrieg, okay? So, the diamond sow technically considered in the genre of comparative religion, is a powerful tutelary deity of Tibetan Buddhism known as Vajrayogini. But in Planetary Tantra, we have the habit of fondly calling her Miss Piggy. Now, Miss Piggy is really, really high on the agenda, on the curriculum of Planetary Tantra. This Dakini, what do I mean when I speak of Dakinis? Dakini literally means a sky dancer, someone who moves in space, okay? But I'm going to say, for the sake of being user-friendly, that you can think of Dakini in the same way you think of frequency. Dakini is just a frequency. Dakini is sky dancer, kandroma in Tibetan, kandroma. Sky dancer, something, some force that moves or dances in space. Well, that's a frequency, isn't it? And if you want to assign a number to the frequency, then you can say band 12. So if you're uncomfortable with this notion of Dakini or some kind of divine feminine entity, which is called in the Celtic language a fairy, F-A-E-R-Y, a fairy is a terribly powerful and in some respects dangerous supernatural entity in Celtic folklore. It's not a little Tinkerbell type elf-like creature that flutters around like a butterfly. So Dakinis are fairies. They are supernatural entities operating in the atmosphere of the earth and out of the ground of the planet. They are both telluric and atmospheric. And they have the nature of frequencies. So the planetary animal mother Gaia Sophia transmits from her body on these frequencies. And in fact, she transmits on 16 
discrete frequencies. And number 12 of those, band 12, is assigned to Miss Piggy, who may also be called, if you're more comfortable with that, Tantra Mother. Now she's called Tantra Mother because she is the only one of the frequencies of Dakini energy who has a particularly maternal quality. Generally, the frequencies of the planetary animal mother are not maternal. I want to think about that. They're not necessarily nurturing as such, and they are certainly dissociated from the act of reproduction, of biological reproduction. So there is an exception, however, with Vajrayogini or Tantra Mother. All right, so let me see if I can bring all of this, yada yada, around to the point. Point is that if you're pretending that you need something that you don't actually need, then that act of pretending will cripple you and it will prevent you from actually performing or realizing that which you innately have in you. I'll give you an example. Suppose there's someone who can walk perfectly well. You can walk normally. You can even walk up and down stairs. You can climb hills. You can walk across a narrow stream, shallow stream. But you take up a pair of crutches and you walk around on crutches pretending that you need crutches when in fact you can walk without crutches. What kind of situation is that? But it gets worse. That's not really the situation of the human animal, including Indie Christians. I'm including Indie Christians and focusing on them for a reason, but the problem of pretending is universal to the human animal. For instance, people in New Age are all pretenders. They're all into make-believe. People in Buddhism are pretending. Pretending to be compassionate. So, to bring my point to you finally home here, let me offer you a little parable. This is called the parable of the beggar. Pobrecito. The parable of the little poor beggar. Now suppose there is a little beggar and that beggar wants to be rich. And so he or she starts to pretend to be rich. Now this is complete foolishness. And people who see the beggar laugh and they, they realize, look at this beggar parading around in rags pretending that they are royal robes. Look at this bag, beggar eating dog food out of a can pretending that they're having a royal feast. So the beggar pretends to be rich. This is the parable of the beggar. But suppose that someone comes to the beggar and gives him or her a fortune. So suddenly, the beggar is rich. The beggar has a fortune untold wealth. And what does the beggar do? It continues to pretend that it is rich rather than to actually be rich. That is the parable of the beggar and that is the dilemma of pretending. Release from pretending is a momentous act of liberation currently underway in Sophia's correction. Now I advise you that I can indicate a time parameter for this event. It began intensely 
in October and November of 2017 and will continue through the entirety of 2018. So you can look forward to the year 2018 as the year of release from pretending. Now, I've experienced release from pretending already, and so has everyone in my company and many, many people who have come into Planetary Tantra. And those of us who observe the guidance and instruction coming on band 12, the frequency of Tantra Mother, have undergone release from pretending. What I'm saying to you is the entire species is now due to go through release from pretending. But the great liberation at hand can only be a conscious realization of those who deliberately select to go through it. So it's an opportunity offered to the entire world, but it depends on those who opt to go through it. See that? So I'm not predicting or supposing or proposing that some momentous event is going to come over the entire human race. But I will say this, however, just as sure as there are massive planetary changes taking place, for instance, the growth of the polar ice caps, which is going to lead to a mini ice age, this is an event, a physical material event on the planetary scale. Certain changes in the ionosphere, the heating up of the ionosphere, increased turbulence in the jet stream. These are material physical events on the planetary scale. You get that? Just so and exactly so, release from pretending is a physical event on the planetary scale. The difference is that this physical event operates like a massive tsunami that pours through the psyche of the species. Many, many will go under in that tsunami, but some will ride in the curve in the curl, excuse me. Those who ride in the curl of the tsunami, which is now breaking across the planet and will break all through the year 2018, have the sublime opportunity for release from pretending. It comes through the instruction of the diamond sow, Miss Piggy, Tantra Mother. It is uniquely the instruction of that tutelary deity to give her the technical name that you would find in a treatise on religious psychology or the history of religion. A tutelary deity. A, a deity that instructs a supernatural agency or power that instructs humanity. That is the diamond, Sal. So, I arrive at 53 minutes and I don't want to go over an hour. So let me once again bring it around to the point. Get to the point, Lash, right? Bring it around to the takeaway. I end where I began. I give you a nursery rhyme. What is the power at the end of pretending where the story of evil has a lovely ending? Yeah, what is the power at the end of pretending? Well, what is pretending? It's make-believe. It's fairy tales about God or the Messiah or the Creator or the Apostles or the miracles of Jesus. It's fairy tales about the Virgin Mary 
but equally so, it's fairy tales about, well, let's say, witches and warlocks. It's make-believe magic. Pretending is make-believe magic. And the power that comes at the end of pretending, well, guess what that is? Now, you can't have the power that comes from comes through release from pretending unless you go through it, unless you really experience that release. But when you do, when you are released from pretending, then you have a power that you could never ever achieve through make-believe. problem with make-believe, and our new age is rampant with this as much as Christianity and all the other religions, they're nothing but just junk. They're junkyards of make-believe and magical thinking. The problem with make-believe, whether it be about the Messiah or whether it be about witches and warlocks and wizards, is that it blocks true magic. True magic is not make-believe. Otherwise, it wouldn't be true. Can you see that? Now, there are lots of people in the world today, I know, and some of them may be listening to my words right now, who would say, well, magic, in quotes, whatever John Lash means by magic, it's got to be a heap of garbage, you know. This man is delusional. He's talking magic. But interactive magic with Gaia is the definition of planetary tantra. Is that make-believe? Well, my friends, that's not a theoretical question. You want to find out if it's make-believe or not. You must undergo release from pretending. Otherwise, you can never know. If you've never seen pearl, you can't distinguish it from plastic. If I place in your hand a heap of plastic beads and tell you they're pearls, you're going to take them for pearls. And holding those beads in your hand, fill your hand with plastic beads well, there's no room for you to receive real pearls into your hand. And you wouldn't even know the difference if you hadn't seen real pearls. See what I mean? It's a trick proposition, but it's also a portal of liberation. Tantra Mother, the Diamond Sow, takes you through the portal of liberation and her way to do that is to teach you, show you and subject you to release from pretending if you are willing to undergo that initiation, that act of ultimate liberation into being an authentic human animal with power that can make a difference. And not just someone who wishes to be good and do good and make a difference, but is in fact powerless and impotent to do so. Do you ever wonder what good people can do in this battle against the enemies of life and the psychopaths. It's pretty clear now who some of them are out there, but you can't do anything about them, can you? What can you do about them? What if you had direct power to act on them as you chose, even at a distance? That would be magic, right? Magic has been defined as action at a distance, or what we call in planetary tantra, APA, Action in the absence of physical agency. 
APA. The absence of physical agency means that you don't have ordinary physical contact with the object upon which you act, but you affect it nonetheless. The magic of the diamond sow is just that, just that power to effectuate real magical acts. But you cannot have that power as long as you remain in make-believe, in magical thinking, in pretending. So I'll leave it at that exactly one hour, a little longer than I would have cared to do. And I remind you as ever, heed the obvious. You know, look at what's obvious. It's obvious that the Abrahamic religions are all founded on the right of child sacrifice. And that ain't a metaphor. Heed the obvious. Hold to correction. There's your best chance for a future worth living.